help me to live out the rest of my days. Truly, as a son, as a daughter who is confident in their father, their heavenly father's love for them. Can we pray that? Thank you. 
Grab your Bible. Grab your Bible. We're actually going to hop into the Gospels for the rest of the summer. Um, we did the Psalms up to this point. Now we're going to transition a little bit. So grab your Bible, Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10 this morning. If you did not bring a Bible, grab that phone. Google with me Luke 10. We're going to look at verses 38 through 42 as we kick off this new sermon series titled Encounter. Basically what we're doing is up to this point, if you haven't been with us, we have been through the summer psalms. And kind of my thesis is COVID wrecked a lot of our disciplines, our devotionals, and basically our rhythms of life. And our, you know, especially our, our spiritual disciplines, um, it didn't discriminate. So what we've been trying to do hammering through week by week in the summer is we look at a different psalm. But my challenge has been read one psalm a day. And we're kind of connecting with the Psalms to jumpstart our quiet time and our devotional time with the Lord. So, uh, so that's where we've been up to this point. And I am going to say something that is probably a little risque. Reading the Bible is not enough. Reading the Bible is not enough. It is a leg of the Christian faith. But just reading it does not bring its full potential into our souls and spirits. We have to do something with it. And so what we're going to do the remaining five weeks of the summer is we're going to look at what do we do with the Word of God. And what I'm proposing, is, especially these next five weeks, is we're running into the living Word of God, Jesus Christ. And we're going to hit on it this morning of, okay, so we have this knowledge... But God isn't after knowledge and all your information. God is after the transformation within your life for his glory. And so how do you make that jump? How do you cross that bridge? And that's the big question we're going to be asking ourselves as we look at various encounters that the Son of God had with various folks throughout the gospel. So this morning is Luke 10, starting at verse 38. I want to invite you to follow along with me as I read. Luke 10, starting in verse 38. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations she had that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, and indeed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. This, friends, is the word of the Lord. Praise be to God. So we're going to look at Martha and Mary, and just full disclosure, full confession, um, I worked on this text all week. And I found myself in the spirit of Martha. So much so in the spirit of Martha that I called John, yes, Friday, and I said, we're going to preach a different text. I'm not ready for this text. And that's when kind of the Lord really hit my heart that that's precisely why you should preach the text. And as we kind of read it, you can kind of pull out, you know, where I'm going to go with this. What's the application of the text this morning? It's pretty straightforward. And yet... What I found, at least, uh, walking with the Lord, working in church, preaching, is sometimes a straightforward text is the most difficult. Not for understanding it, but for applying it. And so I kind of want to look at it with fresh eyes this morning, revisit Mary and Martha and what's going on in the principle that Jesus is putting forth this morning. So as we start verse 10, we see Jesus and his disciples were on their way, and they came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. So a couple things. At this point in Luke, Jesus has set his face towards Jerusalem. He set his face for the purpose by which he came, which was to go to Jerusalem, be betrayed, and die on that cross. And he's beginning this journey there uh, to fulfill this purpose. And so as he's going there, it, we're told he comes to a village which we know, uh, Mary and Martha, we'll get to in a second, but we know the village is Bethany. Bethany is a village. Bethany was like a suburb of Jerusalem to the east. 
And so they get to the city and we're told that a woman named Martha opened her home to him. And then we're told in verse 39, she had a sister, Mary. So I want to pause for a second and just look at the two characters in place. We got Martha and we have Mary. Now, scripturally speaking, we don't know a ton about Martha and Mary, but we also know there's a ton of different Marys within the Gospels. And so the ones we're looking at, Martha and Mary, you guys might recognize these two as having a brother named Lazarus in Luke 11, or uh, John 11, and then again in John 12 it's referred to. So these are the two sisters with their brother Lazarus. And Martha, we'll start off with her, Martha is my type of girl. Martha is my type of girl. What we know of Martha through these uh, a couple counters is Martha is kind of this type A personality. She's somebody that takes charge. Uh, she knows how to get things done. She's a go-getter. She has goals. She has an agenda to do, and she has no problem going forth to go fulfill it. At the same time, um, Martha is considerate. Martha is proper. So where I get that is, interestingly, in John 11, Lazarus has died. He's been in the tomb for four days. Jesus comes on the scene, and he says in verse 39 of John 11, he says, hey, roll away the stone. And Martha, my gal, is like, Jesus, he's been in there for four days. That's going to stink. Are you sure about that? And just out of this consideration, she's somebody who steps in. She takes charge. And we're told that uh, she had a home with her sister, Mary. And Martha starts out great. She invites Jesus and his disciples into her home. Um, and at this point, what we can kind of pull from Scripture is this is the first interaction of Mary and Martha with Jesus. So they have not crossed paths with him. They just heard about his reputation. He's the teacher. He's the healer. He's the prophet who's been working and at work and bringing in this transforming message all throughout Judea. And now he's coming through our hometown. And so she says, well, hey, why don't you come in? I want to personally invite you into my home. And that's Martha. Now Mary, on the other hand, Mary's probably the, the middle sister. Those older and younger siblings in this room, you know a middle sister when you see one. Mary, we're told in verse 39, is sitting at Jesus' feet listening to what he said. Jesus is at their house. Mary is just sitting there listening to Jesus. In fact, every single time we come across this Mary in the Gospels, she is at Jesus' feet, right? So here she's sitting, listening to his teaching. Uh, John 11, Lazarus died. Mary comes and she falls at Jesus' feet. The next chapter, John 12, Mary, the same Mary, comes in and she, uh, she pours the alabaster jar on Jesus and then she wipes up his feet with her hair. That's the same Mary. Every single time she comes up, she's sitting at the feet of Jesus, And this is important because of, it reveals a lot of her character. Remi mind you, this is the very first time this Mary has met this Jesus. And right away we can deduce, we can pull that Mary recognizes that Jesus is superior. That she needs to be in a place of listening to this man. There's something about this man, Jesus, and she has no qualms of putting herself in this posture. The second thing is Mary recognizes that Jesus can tell her things that she can't learn anywhere else. We're going to get to kind of where we got there in a little bit. The third thing is that she recognizes that Jesus welcomes her to be near him. And this is counter-cultural because although it was allowed for women at the time to be taught in the synagogue, it was not allowed for a rabbi to teach a woman in the context of a home. And yet she knows that she's safe, it's a good place to be, to be sitting at Jesus' feet. And not only that, Mary recognizes that it's not just information she wants from Jesus, but it's a relationship. 
because we're told she's sitting there and she's listening to what he had to say. Or more literally, we can translate that, is she's soaking in every word from his mouth. It's this posture Mary's in. And it's, we're kind of already beginning to see why that's so important. But moving on, verse 40, we're told Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. Martha's distracted. Like I said, Martha's my type of gal. I married a type A, and I, I know it when I see it. And so I think we kind of write off Martha a little bit, um, especially growing up and hearing this text, reading this text, we kind of have the impression that there's three people in this house, that there's Jesus, and then there's Martha getting everything ready, and then Mary is sitting at his feet. And for some reason, Martha's just very distracted. But I think the, the context reveals why Martha's distracted and why it is a little justified. First point is, it seems like this is a spur-of-the-moment visit. We're told in verse 38, as Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village. Now, this could mean that they found out the day they were coming in. Or it could mean they found out a couple days as they were on their journey. We don't know exactly, did Jesus send a messenger or whatever, but all of a sudden, it's kind of the spur of the moment, oh my gosh, people are coming to my home. I got to cook, I got to clean, I got to sweep, I got to get the restroom ready, I don't want to be embarrassed by all this stuff. It's just spur of the moment. Secondly, the sheer size of the party of guests. As I said, uh, growing up, I'm just like, three people. But if you look at the context, it says Jesus and his disciples, which, okay, 12, 12 disciples plus Jesus, that's 13 people. So she's providing for 13 people. Now that's a lot. Uh, especially, you know, if, if you're not used to welcoming people in your house. However, the context, the context seems to suggest something a little bit more. If you were to look at the opening verses of chapter 10, Luke 10, verse 1, says this, After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two. He sends them on this mission into the villages. And then it goes straight into a parable. And then it goes straight into Mary and Martha's home. The context seems to suggest we are looking at 72 plus 12. It says uh, Jesus appointed 72 others plus 12. That's 84 plus Jesus. 85 people. 85 people. That's like three or four times the amount of people in this room right now. Into her personal living space. Let me tell you something. I, I'm German, Dutch German, and I don't have a big family. We don't even really like to be around each other, so hosting big parties isn't that big of a deal. I married an Italian, and I learned two things. Italians love each other, they love to be around each other, and Italians love to eat. Every Thanksgiving at my in-laws, it's not just Clary and I and our parents. It's like, fourth, fifth, sixth cousins. I need like a spreadsheet of how everybody's related. But a typical Thanksgiving in, an, in this Italian family is like 25 to 40 people, which isn't that big talking to some of y'all in your family gatherings. That is double the size. Double the size, 85 people coming. Spur of the moment, huge crowd. But not only that, to host somebody at this time in the Middle East, to host and show hospitality, is more than just having good food together. There's a relational component to hospitality, right? So in the ancient Near, Near East, uh, and especially in the Middle East now, to show hospitality means either to establish or preserve a relationship. And so kind of what's rolling around in Mary's head is there's this man with a reputation, Jesus the Christ, and he's coming to my house, and I want to make such an impression that I have this relationship with him. Right? So it's not that she's just fixing a bunch of peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. She's going full bore to cook the food. At the same time, she's cleaning every windowsill, scrubbing every toilet, Vacuuming every single corner in preparation. Why? And this is my fourth point. 
remember who's coming in town. Jesus Christ, the very centerpiece of the nation of Israel, more importantly, the very centerpiece of human, uh, human history itself. So let me ask you, would you be a little distracted too? Would you be a little distracted too? It seems to me that Martha isn't the strange person in the story. Mary is. This is Mary's house as well. And we're told that Martha is distracted. This is a key phrase in the text this morning. Because to be distracted sounds so innocent. We're not told, you know, Martha, she's this adulteress, or she's a thief, or a murderer, or she's been offering sacrifices to Baal. She's distracted. That sounds so innocent. And yet the word used here carries the sense of being pulled away or dragged away from something. And what it reveals is Martha is being controlled. Love was not motivating Martha's service. Anxiety was. Anxiety was. Anxiety over what? Anxiety over her circumstances. She was controlled by her circumstances rather than her faith. And the picture that Luke is painting for us is that Martha actually wanted to hear what Jesus had to say. She wanted to hear it, but she needed to do her circumstances. She needed to fulfill her agenda. She needed to do what she thought needed to be done. But she wanted to be at Jesus' feet. And the other thing, interestingly, about this is both Mary and Martha, they're both hearing the words of Jesus. But the words have a very different effect on the two sisters. And so we must ask ourselves, what is the fundamental difference between Mary and Martha? And the answer is, Mary was on her knees, and Martha was running around. Mary submitted herself to his teaching, while Martha had her own agenda to fill. Our posture before Jesus Christ, brothers and sisters, makes all the difference. Martha's running around. She's distracted. She's got things to do. Uh, she wants to be there, but, you know, she's got her own to-do list. Whereas Mary is just sitting there. It's a sign of humility and submission. In Scripture, to be at somebody's feet means giving up yourselves. It's forfeiting, right? And so the picture, the, the word used is actually a military word in which the, uh, basically the losing side waves a white flag. Hey, we're going to give up. And that's a picture of what Mary's doing here. She's low. She's putting herself low under the authority of Jesus. Or said another way, Martha did not have a head problem. She had a heart problem. Remember, she's hearing the same message that Mary's hearing. We could say that the words Jesus was saying was hitting Martha in the ears, but for some reason it's not traveling the 18 inches to her heart. And that is a difference that posture makes. When we allow God's words to go beyond our ears, beyond our own heads, down to our heart, it stimulates in us something that God's purpose for his word is supposed to do. And the message even right here is if you're going to experience true life-changing hope, then you must be willing to give God your heart and not just your head. And here's the bridge. We've been doing the summer psalms. We're learning about psalms. We're learning about God. But is it traveling to your heart? Is it making a difference? Or is it just sitting up here for your information? But it's more than that. Mary's posture was not just to be humble under a teaching because she wasn't listening to any teacher. It was humility before the very word of God. Let me, let me parse this out. We're told she's listening. She's soaking it up like a sponge. She can't get enough of what's going on. But it's not enough to have a Bible study. No, 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 no. You have to have fellowship with the one whom the Bible is written about. 
It's not about your knowledge of theology. It's not about your knowledge of the Bible that makes a difference in your life. We know that because there are people in seminaries all the time, all over the place with PhDs, and they are still blind as spiritual bats. Yet they have the most knowledge of anybody else. They can pass tests, but they have no spiritual insights. Why? Because it's staying right here. And it's true for us here that we can come to church week after week, year after year, but we do not allow Jesus to leave this place and go home with us. Unless Jesus can come home with you, and he can have your undivided attention in his presence, which is intimate fellowship, then your eyes and your heart will stay blind and hard, and you'll wind up with all this content and no spiritual life. And what I'm trying to say is, when the living word gets connected to the written word, you have the operative power of the word. When you have the living word, which is Jesus Christ, connected with the written word, scripture, that is when this ignition of power and change comes into your heart and your life. But you have to connect the two. You have to allow the two to connect. And Martha just isn't getting it. She's controlled by her circumstances. And if we look, she goes on, she comes to Jesus, she gets mad at God because of her circumstances. Look at what she says. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her to help me. In other words, what she's saying, she left me. My sister was helping me in the beginning, And now she's not helping me. You do something about it. Or we could say Martha's annoyance leads to a theological questioning of if God really cares or not. And we do this all the time. We care more about serving Jesus than being alone with Jesus. Her theology, we could say, is being controlled by her perception of her circumstances, and she's blaming Jesus why she's having such a stressful time. She has missed the point of Jesus being there, so much so that she doesn't even ask Jesus. She just tells him. And you know, she's really mad because she doesn't even talk to her sister. She goes straight to Jesus. All you siblings out there, you've been there. You're so mad at your sibling, you just bypass them to tattle on them to your mom and dad. That's the heart of what's going on. And the point I'm trying to make is there are practical theological implications for this. Let Let me parse this out. Martha had an agenda. She was going to do this. And then she wanted Jesus to bless her efforts. Whereas on the other hand, Mary was simply submitting. There's an author, Henry Blackaby. He wrote this Bible study series called Experiencing God. And one of the premises that he was saying is, as Christians, especially if we're trying to seek what God wants for our lives, what we often make the mistake of doing is we come up with our own plans, our own agendas. We, want, we think we know what God wants of us in our church. We go on and we do this, and all the while we're saying, God, I'm over here. Can you bless me? Can you bless my efforts? And he said, but in Scripture, it's the opposite. In Scripture, they never start something and want God to bless it. They find where God's already at work, and they join him in it. Do you see the difference? And Martha falls into this. And look how Jesus responds in verse 41. This is not a rebuke. This is a correcting moment for her. He says, Martha, Martha, repeats her name. Now in Luke, this means something. Whenever a name is repeated in Luke, it kind of carries this intense emotion of affection, affection and an intensity of concern. Right? So the disciples are on the lake. A storm comes and they cry out, Master, Master, don't you care we're going to drown? Master, Master. Jesus comes along, Lake, uh, Luke 13. He says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. How I wished 
to gather your children. He's caring about the city of Jerusalem. Also in Luke 22, Jesus comes to Peter and says, Simon, Simon, Satan has had to sift you as wheat. So repeating a name kind of carries this. He cares about her. He loves her. He's not mad and yelling at her. He's saying, you're so misguided, and I'm concerned of where it's going to lead you. And so what's he concerned about? He says, you are worried and upset about many things. You are worried and upset about many things. What he's not saying is, you have to pick one or the other. Either you're serving Jesus or you're soaking in Jesus. He's not saying, no, 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 pick one of the two. He said, your priorities are all out of whack. Your priorities are all out of whack. Do you prioritize Jesus before you start serving? Or are you more worried about your service to him that, you know, personal time with him just kind of goes by the wayside? Let me ask you a question. Think about, think about this past week. If I were to give you $1,440 a day, and in return I just asked for $30, would you accept it, and would you do it? Come on, $1,440, okay, okay. Did you know you have 1,440 minutes in your day? What's 30 minutes to spend with the Lord? You have no idea what 30 minutes of prioritizing Jesus over your agenda, how that will transform your life. And that's what Jesus is saying, your priorities are all out of whack. Listen, I know you're busy. I know you got stuff to do. Colby, I know you got that nine-month-old baby crying. But do you prioritize me and my presence over everything else? Do you see how superior and worthy I am? It's interesting because John 17, Jesus comes along and he prays to the Father at last and he says, Father, sanctify them. Sanctify them. What he's saying is, you know, Father, these are the ones you gave me. You've saved them, you justified them, and now, God, Father, please sanctify them, change them, make them holy, make them conform to my image. How did he ask for us to be sanctified? Sanctify them in your truth. Your word is truth. Brothers and sisters, that is why we study this book. We're not doing it for knowledge to move on with our days so we can quiz each other. We're doing it for a sanctifying transformation in our lives. We look at Mary and Martha. We look at Martha. Martha's serving. Mary is being sanctified by the word. As a written word of God is connecting with the living word of God and it's taking place in our life. Or said another way, and I love Francis Chan, Francis once said, we never grow closer to God when we just live life. It takes deliberate pursuit and attentiveness. Are you pursuing Jesus? Are you making his presence a priority in your life? And so my ending question is, is this the point of the text? Is it this simple? Colby, you didn't spend enough time with me this week. Is it that simple? You just need to spend more time with Jesus. It is, but it goes deeper. One more contextual thing I want to point out to you is right before this, in Luke 10, 25, we're told a lawyer approaches Jesus. And the lawyer says to Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, what is written? And he said, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus goes on to say, okay, you go and do otherwise. The man says, well, who's my neighbor? And then the next story is the story of the Good Samaritan. And the point of the Good Samaritan, Jesus ends up saying, who proved to be a neighbor? Love your neighbor. And it, as we turn to Martha and Mary, what Luke is intentionally doing by putting it here is showing us how do you love God with all your heart 
and soul and mind and strength. It's by sitting in the presence and learning and soaking in Jesus. So it's not just something that's good for you and, hey, you just need to do better because Pastor Colby said I need to spend time with Jesus. Scripturally speaking, this is how you love God. This is how you obey God. This is how you live the Christian godly life. How? By sitting and prioritizing Jesus Christ in his word. That is the message, and the beauty of it is, through Christ, each of us, when you put your faith in Christ, he not only saves us, but then he gives us his Holy Spirit. In the Holy Spirit's presence, we've been given the capacity to experience him in our own unique and personal ways. And if we take the time to learn from him about him, when we connect the written word with the living word, when we prioritize Christ, the operative power begins to change our hearts and our lives, not only to feed our souls, but enables us to feed others as we go along. And that is the beauty of Mary and Martha. Not that we should do it, but that because Jesus died and rose again, he enables us the ability to do it and rewards us as we step into it. And so my question is, do you prioritize Jesus? One commentator said, the only reason Mary could be Mary is because she had Martha. And the point is, listen friends, there's stuff to do. There's committees to serve on. There's neighbors to love. There's people to preach the gospel to. There's budgets we have to go through. He's not saying, you've got to pick and choose. He's saying, do you prioritize Jesus? Do you prioritize him? We join me in prayer as I'm going to pray for us, um, just for God to ignite this priority, this thirsting in our souls. We join me in prayer. Father, we praise you. We thank you, God. We thank you for sending your son, Jesus, not only on a rescue mission to rescue us rebels, to save us sinners, Father, but... Thank you for sending Jesus to satisfy us. Jesus, you said you've come so that we may have life in abundance. And God, I, I'm going to confess myself and I'm going to confess alongside those in this room, I don't know if we necessarily believe that with everything we have. And that's evident by how we spend our time, how we treat you, Jesus, in the midst of our day, and Jesus, I'm going to confess that, and I'm going to ask that you would send your Holy Spirit into each one of our lives this morning, that you would implant in our guts a deep hunger and thirst for righteousness. God, I pray that this week, that each of us in this room and listening in this morning, God, that you would enable us to prioritize your presence, that we would turn to your word, not merely for information, but we turn to your word to feast on all that your word has for us. And God, I pray that as we hear this word, we would submit to it. That we would not bring our own agendas to it, but that we would simply sit at your feet, Jesus, to learn and to hear your voice. And we thank you, Jesus, for your gospel that enables all of this. God, we praise you and ask this in our lives. Father, we pray for those just in difficult seasons. Father, we also want to just live, simply lift up, God, those in our contacts, those in our circles who are just struggling. Struggling financially or physically or emotionally or spiritually, God. I pray that in this season of COVID, as things are kind of all over the place, God, I pray that your grace would manifest in our lives, that your grace would manifest in their lives as well. God, that in this tumultuous time, God, that you would reveal yourself to be the God of hope of who you really are. So we thank you, Lord, for who you are and what you've accomplished for us. We lift up all these things to you, Jesus, for your glory, asking these things in your name, praying the prayer you taught your disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. It's all for the glory of Jesus.